Well, we are entering hour 18 of our Learn the Bible in 24 Hours project, in which we're going to focus on what's arguably one of the most important books in the entire Bible. It's Some people would call it the Gospel according to Paul. And uh, the book of Romans, the epistle to the Romans. And this, this book systematically puts, first of all, everybody on, the, on a level playing field. But it primarily does so by removing all excuses and recourses. Now, there, there are 13 epistles that are assigned to Paul. This is the first of them. We're not going to go... We've just picked one of Paul's epistles to take as the representative one. We've, take, we've taken the most challenging one, if you will. There'll be a subsequent, uh, uh, there'll be eight others after this that are called the Hebrew epistles. The book of Hebrews, which is unsigned, we believe it's Paul's, but that's another story. But the rest of these are written specifically to, to the to 12 tribes. James, which is really Yaakov, and uh, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude, all Jewish epistles. Um, Written to Jews, I mean. And then, uh, of course, Revelation being the capstone. So we are going to explore the book, uh, the Epistle of the Hebrews, the definitive gospel according to Paul. It is the most comprehensive doctrinal book in the, in the New Testament. The impact on world history is unequaled by any other book. This book dramatically changed the course of history in the world. See, grace gradually erodes to various forms of legalism. One of the toughest things to really get a grasp of is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We tend to think in terms of rules and boundaries and so forth. And uh, grace gradually will erode to various forms of legalism which become very vacuous. When grace becomes obscured throughout history, it leads to the Dark Ages. Very classically, of course, the 6th through the 16th century which is known as the Dark Ages. It's when grace is rediscovered that the light shines and it changes. And the Kingdom of Blood is our briefing pack on the history of the church. You may want to acquaint yourself with that Dave Hunt and I did together. Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast, is a classic for every serious uh, Christian. The style of the book of Romans is, is highly, highly uh, uh, literate. It's not uh, an unlettered fisherman kind of thing. And this is the most profound writing that exists anywhere. Now that's quite a statement. But it's the most profound writing you will find anywhere. And uh, it has a very international outlook because first of all Paul was not only a Roman citizen but he was well educated in both Hebrew and Greek cultures deep, very deeply. And uh, this is a book which will delight the greatest logician it will hold the attention of the wisest of men, and yet it will bring the humblest soul in tears of repentance at the feet of the Savior. A God that's small enough for our mind would not be big enough for our need. And the issues that Paul hits head on in this are the most profound issues that you'll find anywhere on the planet Earth. Now Paul is the new name for Saul. Paul really means the least, the little one. And he really understood, perhaps more than any of us ever will, the un the understood the grace of God. Because on the one hand, he declared himself, I am the chief of sinners. Paul would put himself at the head of any list of sinners because he persecuted the church. And he so designates himself in 1 Timothy, first letter there. Yet, he will also acknowledge that he was the most devoutly religious man who ever lived. Paul goes through quite a thing there in Philippians 3. Uh, uh, how he diligently was a professional lawkeeper. You need to understand what really lies under this statement is that Jesus Christ was the most anti-religious person that ever walked the planet Earth. Religion started when Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves, and God showed them that by the death, by the innocent uh, blood, that they would be covered. So God has already saved someone. See, if Paul is the greatest sinner and the most religious person around. God has already saved one who is far worse than you and me. And uh, who loved him most back there in Luke 7? The one that was forgiven the most. Remember that parable? The same kind of thing. To whom is the book written? Well, it's written to believers. 
The book of Romans is written to believers, not non-believers. It's not preaching to the unsaved. The unsaved are never named as God's beloved. That's written to God's beloved. That, not, it's not, God did not use that term of unbelievers. It was always believers. The book was designed for teaching the saints, teaching those that are saved. I love what we say, well, what is a saint? What do we mean by a saint? Well, there's a lot of good definitions. I'm not using the classical church definition. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about saints in the biblical sense. Donald Gray Barnhouse is a definition that I like the most. A saint is, saints are a group of displaced persons uprooted from their natural home and on their way to an extraterrestrial destination, not of this planet, neither in its roots nor in its ideals. In other words, we're pilgrims. We're just passing through. Well, there are three main sections of the book of Romans. The first eight are the doctrinal sections. We'll focus on those primarily. It's going to give us the most complete diagnosis of sin and salvation and sanctification in the first eight chapters. Three chapters on defining sin, a couple of chapters on what salvation requirements are, and then sanctification. Then there's a few chapters, three chapters, that have to do with Israel. You could call them dispensational if you like. Israel past, present, and future. It will derive from that foundation, but you'll see that when we get there. And then the last section is the practical. Answers the so what question. Okay, how does it affect us? So what, so what does that mean? How should we live? And so we've got faith, hope, and love in three sections there. What do we mean by the gospel? The gospel is not a code of ethics or morals. The gospel is not a creed to be accepted. The gospel is not a system of religion to be adhered to. The gospel is not good advice to follow. None of these things characterize the gospel in the biblical sense. The gospel is a message concerning a person who solved a problem for not only you and I, but for God Himself. The book of Romans is about grace. And my friend has suggested that grace can be considered an acronym for God's righteousness at Christ's expense. How can God love us without violating His righteousness? His righteousness would demand that a penalty be paid, and what his, his incredible gift to us is the gift of Himself as payment of that expense. God's righteousness at Christ's expense. That pay, that's the price paid to, so God can extend the grace He wants to to us. The, the book of Romans has the most complete and penetrating statement of God's plan, divine plan for our redemption. Christ did not come to make bad men good, but to give dead men life. The big difference. Big difference. Remember the prodigal son? You all know the story of the prodigal son. We don't have to repeat that from Luke 15. Remember how the father, did he, when, the, when the son finally comes back home, did my father, oh, my son has become good. No, that's not what he said. No, he said, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. You see the difference? See the difference? Well, that's us, of course. Another point about the prodigal son is the son never lost his sonship. One of the key verses is in the, the, the chapter 1 of the book of Romans, a profound chapter, but one of the key verses there is verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or Gentile. Unto salvation, not unto reformation, education, progress, or development. Unto salvation. It is for a lost man and no other. Men are either in salvation or in the opposite perdition. And that's, of course, Mr. and Mrs. Men, right? I won't get into that whole debate here. There is a trilogy that altered the course of history. Martin Luther was a, was a devout monk who, or practitioner who was really obsessed with his sinfulness. And he went through all the self-inflicting procedures of the medieval church. 
still unsatisfied, still overwhelmed by his own sinfulness. Until a monk he encountered. He finally decided to go to Rome, up through the Alps to Rome. And on the way there, he encountered a monk that suggested his answer lies in the book of Habakkuk. And when he went through the book of Habakkuk, there's a verse that leapt out at Martin Luther. The just shall live by faith. And that's when he shed, he shed all the things that he had been doing and rediscovered the grace of God. It became the, the, the watchword for the Reformation. And that, of course, changed the history of the world. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? What does that mean? The book of Romans deals with that question. In fact, it's quoted in verse 17 of chapter 1 of Romans. This, book, this verse from Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? The book of Romans deals with justification. The just shall live how? The book of Galatians quotes this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. It describes how, we, how the just shall live. The just shall live by what? By faith. What do you mean by that? The book of Hebrews deals with that. And it's quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, setting the stage for chapter 11 of Hebrews, which is well known as the Hall of Faith. We'll deal with the book of Hebrews when we get there. The just shall live by faith. What fascinates me about this is that the three, these three epistles are a trilogy amplifying Habakkuk 2.4. They, they each quote it as the cornerstone of their epistles. Now, so these are designed as a trilogy. That's one of the many, many reasons I believe the book of Hebrews, even though it's unsigned, uh, is, is, uh, was Pauline and its authorship. I think Paul deliberately did a trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4. If it turns out that Hebrews isn't, wasn't written by Paul, it's even a greater miracle because the Holy Spirit obviously has his thumbprint all over this thing. So, uh, okay. First section of these groups is the doctrinal. The introduction, the plight of pagan man and moral man and religious man. In chapter 1 and 2, we have these three, the, 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 you know, the, the, the pagan, every person is in one of these three groups. And they're all losers. They're all losers. They don't make it. God's greatest problem then is how can He love and reconcile uh, these that are falling short? He does that by His greatest gift. His gift of paying the price, paying their debts. Which brings, of course, the peace of God. And then the death of defeat. One of the cha great chapters, book of Romans, chapter 6. Sin is not going to reign. It ain't going to reign no more. Your power over sin, if you're in Christ... Uh, is there. And uh, we call it chapter 7 law school. That all leads up to the most incredible chapter in many respects in the entire Bible, chapter 8. We'll show you why. The ultimate challenge. What is the greatest thought that has ever entered the mind of man? There's a challenge for a test question. Turn that in before the evening. And what, what's the, <laughs> what is the greatest thought that has ever entered the mind of man? Well, there's probably a number of candidates. Daniel Webster's is probably the best one. My responsibility to my Maker. Try to beat that one. Try to beat that one. See, God created man in His own image, we're told, right? Well, if we are persons, so is God. And since we have personal feelings, so does God. And if God be God, He must be the judge of all. So we learn a lot from just that. You must meet God as He is, not as you might wish Him to be. We need to understand how He sees things. And uh, that's the challenge. You know, it's interesting, when, if you've in large, ever been in a large organization or a large company, if for some reason there's a new president, a new guy takes over, the, the, the new boss, everybody scrambles, well, what's he like? Where's he from? Is he easy? Is he hard? Is he this? Is he, you, know, you try to find, what are his buying habits? What's he, you know, you want to know what the guy in charge prefers, right? Well, it's time we did that with our guy, find out how God sees things, not how we might wish He sees things. The first thing that you really encounter in chapter 1 of Romans is the judgment of pagan humanity for suppressing God's truth and for ignoring His revelation and for perverting God's glory. That's all in chapter 1. And the judgment that God announces may surprise you. I've studied this for many, many years and didn't recognize the nature of what He puts in here. So you and I are born into this lost race. We want to understand. What happens when you suppress God's truth, ignoring His revelation and perverting His glory? You will be astonished to learn of what His judgment is constituted of. 
Romans chapter 1, verse 20. We're all held accountable. It says, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Another place to look is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. No one can escape that. The firmament shows His handiwork. And you go through, read Psalm 19. Read Psalm 8. God can hold us accountable without even picking up a Bible. Just look around. He holds you accountable. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. For this cause, get the judgment that God pronounces on those that refuse. Notice what, what they reject. They haven't rejected Christ yet. We're not talking about doctrinal, you know, the Messiah. We're talking about the creation. The creation, recognize Him as the Creator. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their females, the word is not women in the Greek, it's females. Even their females did, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the males, not men, we're talking males. It's, the Greek is very, you know, uh, crisp. And likewise also the males, leaving the natural use of the females burned in their lust one toward another, males with males, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the error which was meet. I never realized that homosexuality was a judgment of God. That amazed me. Certainly it's a sin. There's a choice involved. I understand that. But there's another aspect of this thing. Because they didn't acknowledge Him as a Creator. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even the females did change the natural use for that which is against nature. And likewise also the males, leaving the natural use of the females, burned in their lust one toward another, males with males working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error of which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God's judgment was the they're abandoning them to a depraved lifestyle. So this is the great leveler. See, we're all equally accountable. The plight of pagan man, the so-called moral man, religious man. Chapter 2 will deal with those last two. So God has a problem. How can He justify unrighteous man without violating His own nature? Without violating His holiness? Without violating His justice? That's His challenge. How does He do that? By giving us the greatest gift. Chapter 3 deals with the problem. Chapter 4 does with, deals with the gift. You know, it's interesting that even Socrates, five centuries before Christ was born, wrote to Plato saying, it may be that the deity can forgive sins, but I do not see how. Great insight. Socrates recognized the problem. I can't see how. May, it may be that deity can forgive sin, but I don't see how. He could not see how God could forgive sins without somebody paying the price for it. What insight? What insight? Why did God give us the law? This will surprise you. Why do we have laws? So you'll behave better. No. So you'll behave worse. No. Yeah. Romans 5.20 Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. For sin to abound, that's the opposite of our thinking. Why is the law to eliminate any ability of man to rationalize away his sin nature? It's there to show us our sin. <laughs> Every time I think of the, of the law as a mirror, I'm reminded of Walter Martin's he was for our audience and he's talking about how the law is like our mirror. It shows us ourselves. But we don't shave with the mirror. We're shaved by grace. <laughs> that crude pun was a... Well, no, anyway, moving on. This will all be explained in Romans 7. I want to contrast two Adams. The first Adam. By one man's fence, uh, offense many died. By one Adam came judgment and condemnation. Through one man's offense, death reigned. 
One man's offense, condemnation to all men. Disobedience of one, many made sinners. This all in, 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 these are verses from 15 through 19 of chapter 5. And, and as a result, sin reigned in death. The last Adam, which is the title of Jesus Christ, by one man's free gift, righteousness to many, for many offenses, the gift of justification, through one man, believers reign in life, the righteousness of one, justification is offered to all, the obedience of one, many declared righteous, the grace reigns eternal life in contrast to the death. The, 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 the failure of the first Adam and the remedy of the last Adam is a contrast that Paul builds in, in uh, the book of Romans. What is the sequence to maturity? We talk about spiritual maturity. Well, there's tribulation. We know what that is. That leads to what? Perseverance. Perseverance leads to experience. And what's the climax? Hope. What a surprise. Through this movement to a maturity, your maturity is when you live in that hope. Moment by moment, continually. But there's, you get to Romans 6, this one is a dandy. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. You now, if you're in Christ, you now have the power over sin. It ain't going to reign no more. And chapter 7 and 8 will detail how. What this reads says, do not let sin continue to reign. It's present imperfect, grammatically speaking. It's present tense, it's imperfect, that means continuing. Let not sin you know, continue. How do you do that? How do you avoid that? How do you avoid sin? How do you have power over sin? By insisting that what God says is true. The dominion is now your choice. It wasn't before. When you weren't in Christ, you, didn't, you were a slave to sin. You didn't have a choice. If you're in Christ, you have a choice. It's not a one-time thing. It's a moment-by-moment -moment faith choice. Not a feeling choice, a faith choice. Moment-by-moment. -moment. That's the goal. And when you stumble and you will, it's first, you remember the Christian's bar of soap, 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's His faithfulness we rely on, not ours. There are three tenses of being saved. We use that term so. You know, I remember I was, when I was at a conference once, a Christian conference, and there was, a, uh, you know, there was some tables and there was, you know, around, there's some extra chairs. And I, asked, I went up there and said, Are these, are these chairs saved? The guy looked up and says, they're not even under conviction. <laughs> but we use that term so many. There is the, uh, the uh, concept of having been saved. Have, have, you, have you been saved? That is from the penalty of sin. That's positional. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and so forth. That's called justification, salvation, if you will. You're saved from the penalty of sin. But there's another kind. There's a present tense. You are being saved from the power of sin. That's operationally. From the Holy Spirit, moment by moment. That's called sanctification. See, we use these terms. Theologians use, define and use these terms slightly differently. And then yet there's the future sense of being saved. You shall be saved. From what? From the presence of sin. That's called the redemption of our body in Romans 8. So you can be, you have been saved positionally in the penalty of sin if you're in Christ. You are being saved from the power of sin operationally, moment by moment, if you'll exercise that in your sanctification. And you shall be saved in the sense from the presence of sin future. This is all developed in the book of Romans. Why was the law given? To expose our sin nature? To incite the sin nature to sin no more? Sin nature cannot be reformed. To drive us to despair of self-effort? And to drive us from, to dependence upon the Holy Spirit alone? If you're relying on your own nature, you've lost. You need to rely on the Holy Spirit moment by moment. Let's contrast the law versus spirit. The law depends on the flesh. The spirit depends on God's power. The law produces rebellion. The spirit produces God's desires. The law results in more sin. The spirit results in righteousness. The law brings wrath. The spirit brings joy, peace, production. The law is not by faith. The spirit is by faith. These are all excerpts from Paul's other epistles. The law kills. The spirit gives life. That's the difference. But let's get, there's one chapter in the book of Romans I, I, we just have to, I, I, I can't resist focusing on. That's chapter 8. Um, this is the dessert, if you will, especially of the first section of doctrinal. Romans 8 deals with deliverance from the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. It deals with the realization of our sonship by the Holy Spirit's inner witness. Don't dismiss this sonship thing as just a theological issue. 
the word a son of God in the Bible refers to a direct creation of God. The, 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 the Benai Elohim in the Old Testament is a term of angels, a direct creation of God. Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I are not. We're descendants of Adam. Unless we're in Christ. In fact, that's even emphasized in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. But to them that received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on His name. In other words, that's what we mean by regeneration. You are, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. You're no longer a creation. You still have a body from Adam, but you have, you're a new creation in, 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 in God's eyes. So, and that's also matured in this whole idea of adoption. Is, is also, you need to, we won't take the time to develop that, but you need to understand the concept of adoption is when a son became entitled to the inheritance. And you need to understand that. And uh, also the preservation and suffering by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're preserved in suffering. That's a growth thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you get to chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, you have a hymn of praise for victory that's unequaled anywhere else in the Bible. It deals with God's logic of our security, and we'll take a look at that. Romans 8 opens with no possibility of condemnation. The first verse in Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Right? And the chapter closes with no possibility of separation. Boy, that's some pretty interesting bookends. Let's take a look at this chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. First four verses. Great opening. Great opening. Chapter 5 dealt with the law. Chapter 8 with victory. Chapter 5 was the summation of the saving work of Jesus Christ. Chapter 8 is the summation of what Christ did to provide victory. Five was a justification, that is to being declared righteous by faith is forever. The guided light in chapter 8 is ensured through the power of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5, our performance is based on the understanding of God's love. Chapter 8, our performance is based on the power of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5, it reveals our relationship to God. Chapter 8 reveals our relationship to the world, conflict, and the flesh. The Holy Spirit is mentioned only once in chapter 5. The Holy Spirit is available to us to give us assured victory all through chapter 8. Chapter 5 is the capstone of our salvation in Christ. Chapter 8 is the capstone of our victory in Christ. There's a difference. Now that raises another question. Why do Christians have trials then? Well, first to glorify God. Daniel 8. Remember the three, the three young men in the fiery furnace? Why were they there? To glorify God, which indeed they did. You might find many other examples. Another reason you have trials is to have discipline, to us discipline for known sin. If you've got sin in your life, God may use trials as a way of taking you to the woodshed. That's not the only reason, but it's one of ten. Another reason we have trials is to prevent us from falling into sin. There's examples of that in 1 Peter 4 and elsewhere. Perhaps one of the most important trials we have is to keep us from pride. God hates pride. That's why He hates pride because that's how sin entered into Satan to begin with. Watch out for pride. We're all victims. Be careful. Another reason is to build faith. First Peter 1 talks about that. Another reason we have trials is to cause growth. You know when a sailor earns a sail is in a storm. Not in a good sunny, sunny afternoon. Another reason we have trials is to teach obedience and discipline. Perhaps one of the most provocative ones is number eight. To equip us to comfort others. Are you going through a very unique trial? Maybe God is putting you through that to equip you to minister to somebody with a like problem. Is it a marital problem, a financial problem, whatever? If you're going through that kind of a trial, one of the reasons you might be going through it is to equip you to minister to others. Maybe you'll gain some expertise in chapter 7 that you could, some other, somebody else can benefit by, or whatever. To equip us to comfort others. Another reason we have trials is to prove the reality of Christ in us. And perhaps the most mysterious of them all is is, uh, for testimony to the angels. We know the angels learn by watching us. God chooses to reveal His plan to the angels through us. 
We find hints of that, not just in Job 1, but also Ephesians 3 and 1 Peter 1. You'll find allusions to that. But here we go from chapter, from Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 39 is my favorite pas- uh, passage in the Scripture. In fact, Romans 8, 28, you might want to put a tab on that page. I, there are times when almost once a day I'll check to make sure it's still there. Okay? Romans 8, let's start with just verse 28. And we know that all things work together for everyone. No, no, no. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Woo-wee. All things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. The question is, what's the three most important words in that verse? What are the most important words in that verse? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. I want to suggest to you the first three. We don't hope. We don't suspect. No, no, no. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That's where the comfort and strength that verse comes from is your confidence those first, that we know that. If so, what follows? Let's take a look here. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate them, He also called. Whom He called them, He also justified. And and whom He justified them, He also glorified. There's a four-step process. Predestinate, called, justified, and glorified. Abraham was predestined. Isaac in his seed was called. Jacob was justified. If God can justify that conniver, He can justify any of us. And of course, Joseph was glorified. Predestinated, called, justified, and glorified. In the four patriarchs, we have that modeled. Which leads to the classical paradox, fate versus predestination. Fate or predestination versus free will. You know, the philosophy books are uh, manifold on this whole dilemma. You, you know, if things are predicted, that mean they're optional? Or are they locked in concrete? Judas betrayed Christ. It was predicted in Psalm 41.9. Did he have a choice? Interesting question, isn't it? That's, that's, that's the paradox, isn't it? Because both are true. Predestination is true, and so is, and so is the free will. See, it's a problem that you and I should not be faced with thanks to the discovery of modern science because we know today that time itself is a physical property. God is outside time. This is only a paradox when when viewed within time. That's why we spent so much time at the beginning of these series to spend some grounding in the nature of the time domain. And if that's confusing to you, go back and check those out in the early Genesis. We, in the early, several places in, this, uh, in these studies, we've touched on this. God is outside of the constraints of the physical universe of time. He alone knows the end from the beginning. This is a paradox only when viewed from within the time domain. Step outside that and the problem goes away. The paradox only exists from within the, when viewed from within the time domain. Paul goes on and says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall say, lay anything to the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifieth. What does he mean by that? Our defense counsel is the prosecutor. We got it wired, gang. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. In other words, <laughs> the judge is our defense counsel, and he is making our petitions for us. Awesome. The fix is in. He continues. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Sometime get a concordance and look up all the more than sentences in the Scripture. More than this and more. We are more than conquerors. This is one of them. There are others. And get to the big, the big finish here. I love this. Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, 
nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Boy. Period. Carriage return. Pause. Man. Well, let's get to the second section. There's a little trilogy here in the middle of the book on, on Israel. Romans 9, Israel's past. Romans 10, Israel's present. And Romans 11, Israel's future. There are other three-chapter trilogies throughout the Bible. You have the three. The Sermon on the Mount is actually a trilogy, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. The second coming in Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. There's others. This little trilogy is the issue of Israel as distinct from the church. Don't let anyone tell you that the church is Israel now and vice versa. No, nonsense. And that's tragic because there are many, many prominent um, authors and churches and so forth that are that have no grasp of God's commitment to Israel, despite the repeated commitments in the Old and New Testament. To deny that is to call God a liar. Be careful. There are many, there are many places in Scripture you can have different views, especially in eschatology, or that is study of the last things. People have slightly different views. That's fine. But be careful that you don't adopt a view that ends up making God a liar. Be careful. Don't impugn the character of God in your views. Mm-mm. But this does raise a question that these chapters try to deal with. If God is so faithful to His Word, as we've just surveyed in Romans 8, that none can be condemned that He has justified, and that none in Him can be separated, that's the pitch we've heard, right? Then why have the Israelites, who were sovereignly chosen and given unconditional promises, completely failed and then been rejected? See the problem? This would sound like a rebuttal to everything that's gone before. And that's what Paul deals with. Where does a Jew go? See, there's also a problem of how Gentiles are to relate to Jews. Not only are Jews should relate to Gentiles, a Gentile should relate to Jews. If circumcision is of no value without faith, then what advantage has the Jew? What is the benefit of circumcision? And when I say circumcision, I include all the ceremonial accoutrements there. This is the same question that was underlying Acts 15. And it is answered in Romans 9, 10, and 11. From Genesis 12 to Acts chapter 2, it's all about Israel. And the whole point of those chapters is that God keeps His promises. And despite Israel's failures, those promises will be kept nationally, not just individually. You see, you and I need a doctrinal understanding, not just a devotional understanding. Most of us in this room, I think, have a devotional understanding at some level. But at the same time, we also need to have a doctrinal understanding of the Word of God. The Abrahamic covenant that we emphasized back in chapter 12, go back and review that when you get a chance. Every benefit you and I have before God derives from His commitment to Abraham. I'll make it of thee a great, there were seven elements. Remember, I make thee a great nation, I'll bless thee, I'll make thy name great, thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee in Abraham shall all families of the earth be blessed, not just the Jews. If you, are, if you are in Christ, you are grafted in. You are grafted in. That covenant was unconditional. It's very important to understand this, because the world at the moment is challenging that covenant. All the tensions in the Middle East are challenges to the God's land grant to Abraham. That was a divinely ordered ritual where the participants in those days would divide a sacrifice and then repeat the terms of a covenant they agreed to as they marched through it. And what God said, has Abraham set that all up? Divides a, 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 a sacrifice. And the idea was that the participants would walk through it, figure eight, repeating the terms of the covenant. That was the way they did things in those days. Except here, before it start, after it's set up, God puts Abraham in deep sleep. He can't walk through. What's his point? God went through in the form of a torch and so forth. He goes it alone to demonstrate that this commitment is unilateral. This can, it's unconditional. And uh, the, the, this, the terms of this covenant were declared eternal and unconditional. It was re- reconfirmed by an oath in Genesis 22 and elsewhere. It was reconfirmed to Isaac and to Jacob. And incidentally, when it was done, they were in acts of disobedience. That's in Genesis 26 and elsewhere. And the New Testament declares it unchangeable, immutable. The covenant of Abraham. Very important to understand that that stands, and our, our benefits derive from its certainty. There is no other promise like that to any other people. 
that's unique. You need to understand that. And how do we get our benefit? We rely on our derivative benefit from the root of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah, none other than Jesus Christ. You and I derive all our benefits in terms of a Jewish Messiah. What, okay, if, 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 if we have that, great, what, what, what good is it to be a Jew? I mean, what, what's the blessing of a Jew? Well, first of all, they receive the words of God. That's what Romans 3 emphasized. They're called Israelites, which means the princes of God, in Genesis 32. They are adopted as sons, not just genealogically, but also by adoptions in Deuteronomy 7, and the glory in Exodus 24. And through all the covenants, those are all benefits. The giving of the law was through them. The temple service and priesthood was modeled through them. All the special promises of the future kingdom. Ruling the world, they will rule the world from Israel. Mount Zion. The world will be politically ruled from there when the time comes. And they also had the blessing of the fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so forth. And the Messiah, ultimately the Messiah would come from them. That's the big one. They will be blinded though. Remember when he rode the donkey, and we went through that so often. The, the donkey rode, uh, when Jesus rode the donkey through the, uh, Jerusalem, he wept. He said, because you do not recognize this thy day, these things are hidden from thy sight. For how long? Paul in Romans tells us how long. He's, Paul says, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Watch these untils. They're milestones. Until what? The fullness of the Gentiles become in. Don't confuse the fullness of the Gentiles with the times of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles is the completeness of the church. And I really love this. This implies that there's a number, a specific number. When it's complete, the church is complete. When that number is reached, the Father will say to the Son, who, the Son's now sitting on the Father's throne, right? When that number is complete, the Father will say to the Son, go get him. And he'll gather his own. That doesn't end God's plan. There's much more coming, but that that's, that's closes a certain uh, dispensation, if you will. Well, you know, that's in, there's a finite number. Not a finite date, a finite number. When that number's reached, it's over. Now, that intrigues me because that means there's a counter somewhere in heaven that keeps track of how full that fullness is, right? And when it's full, it's over. Then son go get him, and then Satan knows he has but little time. This is interesting. Satan doesn't know what the number is, and he doesn't know what its goal is, but he knows there's a finite number, and it's approaching that. Every time somebody trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, a counter in heaven goes click. Another one, click. There's a counter keeping tabs. Um, in India, there's 100 million people that listen to the Christian broadcast there. They have 4 million decisions last year. There's a lot going on there. Something like 18,000 pastors planning 13 churches a week. Exciting stuff going on. Those counter, that counter is speeding up. Now what intrigues me about this is Satan doesn't know that when that counter clicks next, he knows he has but little time. It, changes, he's, he's, it opens a window of opportunity. He's got to move and move fast. But he doesn't know when that is. Every time that somebody accepts Christ, he's shook. You realize that Satan has been in shock treatment for 1,900 years? <laughs> the other side, you know, there may be somebody in this room that has yet to discover Jesus Christ, which when you do accept Christ, you might be that last one we really wish you'd get it together because we'd like to get out of here. Okay? <laughs> there's a prerequisite to the second coming. Not to the rapture. That can happen any moment. But there's a prerequisite to the second coming. Hosea 5.15 highlights it. He says, where God says, I will go and return to my place. He can't return if he hasn't left it. huh? I, re- I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me earnestly. And we talked about that in Hosea. That's by way of review. But let's, the word, there's another one of these untils. There are three untils in the restoration of Israel. The first condition is the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in. We just talked about that. The second one is they have to acknowledge their offense. The third condition is until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles start, the times, not fullness, the times of the Gentiles started with Nebuchadnezzar and they complete with the Antichrist. Three conditions. 
Well, let's say the final section of the book of Romans is, is five chapters on the ask the so what question, our responsibilities. From gifts, from civil responsibilities, Christian maturity, unity within the body, and personal greetings. You know, there are only two worldviews. We covered this at the beginning, but this ties it together. We're, we're either an accident of random chance with no destiny, or we're the result of deliberate and purposeful creation. One or the other. Can't, there aren't any other, other alternatives. And out of this come our questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And to whom am I accountable? These, our answers to these four questions will derive from which of those two worldviews we have. Every answer to every question will derive from your worldview. And uh, it's interesting, in Genesis chapter, the first 11 verses, the first section of Genesis, we had the personal volition, free will established, the freedom to choose your own destiny. Marriage was established, or the model of God's model for intimacy. And the family, the most important element or segment of our society. And of course, human government. And Romans 13 gets into the human government thing. We need to understand that there's no vocabulary in the New Testament for a representative government. They were used to, they were used to uh, 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 monarchies, in effect. We have a strange kind of responsibility because the people who run this country are our employees. We have a responsibility before God. And a very unique opportunity is responsibility. And uh, what the Romans 13 deals with, you know, that uh, rulers are to be a terror to evil works. What happens when they're a terror to good works? There, therein lies the challenge. We have a dual citizenship. And we need to understand that. But we get back, let's talk about maturity. If you, know, if you squeeze a lemon, you get what? Lemon juice, right? You squeeze an orange, you get orange juice, right? If you, what do you get if you squeeze a Christian? You should get Christ. Peter Drucker, who's one of the outstanding authors in the management literature, anybody that's been in professional management knows the writings of Peter Drucker. And he's quite an interesting guy. But somebody asked him once, are you a Christian? Felt that he was by a number of things he said without getting into any theology. He had a great answer. So that's for you to tell me. Ooh, I like that. Chuck, are you a Christian? I don't know, you tell me, am I? I like that. Romans 14 talks about spiritual maturity in a surprising way. There's some advice here. It says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him that which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. What he's talking about here is some people, you know, don't eat meat. For religious reasons. Others are, you know, some are vegetarian, some eat anything. Fine. Either way. Don't let one, you know, disparage the other is what he's saying. Right? But I want you to notice something subtle here. Who's the one that's weak in the faith? The one that's living by rules. See? One believes that he may eat all things. Anything's all right. Another who is weak eateth herbs. It limits himself to herbs. You see, it's the person that's trying to bound himself with rules that's weaker in faith. That's why he needs the rules. It's a very subtle thing, but notice what he's saying. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let, and, so and it goes on here. See, the inversion of perspective. The person that's weak is oriented to legalistic externals. Keeping the Sabbath. Watching a kosher diet or whatever. Those are rules. Doesn't mean they're bad. My wife and I try to keep the Sabbath. We we have a we celebrate with a, a Messianic Jew on Friday night, little potluck dinner and a Bible study and so forth. We have, uh, but we don't keep the Sabbath in a Jewish sense. No, no, we're not. No, we have. We have. Uh, um, we keep the Sabbath because we notice that uh, in the millennium, this, the, the temple will only be open on Shabbat and the new moon. That uh, the um, uh, all nations are going to go up to Jerusalem to worship on Shabbat and the uh, Feast of Tab Tabernacles. So um, there isn't there isn't anywhere in the Bible that Sunday replaced Saturday. That's not the point. We worship on Sunday because we're celebrating the Lord's resurrection. That's fine. No problem with that. And uh, we have three. We, we, we for ourselves we we we, just, we we are trying to avail ourselves of the blessing that God has. He has rules that uh, that He's uh, uh, suggested that enrich our lives. So what my wife and I do, we have three rules. 
we agree to do whatever we're going to do together. We agree, whatever we do, we can do deliberately. And we also do together. And the third rule is there are no other rules. <laughs> so we don't keep the Sabbath in a Jewish sense. We keep the Sabbath in the sense of Genesis uh, 2. But, uh, but the main point is uh, we're, we're not oriented to the legalistic externals, but we've just discovered what a blessing that can be. See, the ones that are weak are oriented to legalistic externals. The ones that are strong have full liberty in Christ. They're not measured by what we give up. People say, come up to me, Chuck, is it okay for Christians to smoke or to dance or whatever? Fill in the blank whatever you like. That's not the question they should be asking. That question demonstrates a lack of faith, a l- no understanding of our liberty in Christ. Now, our liberty in Christ doesn't give us a license to sin. There is a little different issue. But uh, we need to understand the difference between the, the, faith and, the faith and the law. See, Romans 5, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord doth he not regard it. He that eateth, eateth the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Love this. Colossians, in Paul's epistle to Colossians, he says a similar thing. Colossians 2. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day, or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. See, all these things are instructive. There's no greater blessing for a Christian than to discover the prophetic significance of the Jewish things, even, even Hanukkah. It's in John 10, verse 22, for those that haven't looked it up. Um, doesn't mean you keep them in the sense of rigid laws and rules. Those are just to be instructional. But uh, we have liberty in Christ. He's the fulfillment. All these, everything is prophetic of Christ anyway. Romans 15, 4 is also a verse that's very, very precious because it demonstrates, it certifies, if you will, the integrated purposeful design of the total package. For whatsoever things, how much of the Bible does that include? Just the New Testament? Just the Old Testament? No. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning that we through the patience or perseverance and comfort or encouragement of the Scriptures might have hope. Whatsoever things. So when you wade through those tedious chapters of Leviticus, know that if you're diligent and peek behind them, there are treasures. Every detail, every word in the Scripture was there deliberately by design. And once you discover that for yourself, that doesn't mean you'll unravel all of them. Heavens, that's a lifetime thing. But the more you unravel them and realize they're all there with a purpose, that it's all like, it's like a huge tapestry. And some of it, you, you can get too close to the threads to really understand the total design. Stand back and see how it all put together. You realize you're dealing with a masterpiece in which every detail, every thread in it is deliberately there for a purpose. Master craftsman. Now the rest of the book, near the end of the book, you have personal greetings. There are more personal greetings in the book of Romans than any other epistle. There's over 33 by name plus others. And they include some that are slaves and some that are royalty. The whole span is there. Now, if somebody says, if somebody says, who wrote the book? If you want to challenge one of your friends at a Bible says, who wrote the book of Romans? One Paul. It was Tertius. He was his amanuensis. It was written by Tertius for Paul. Paul dictated it. <laughs> okay. And uh, amanuensis, like a secretary, okay. And uh, it's, see, their professional secretaries were very common in those days. Many people there were very bright, but maybe not literate in the usual sense. Some were not literate at all. Some, even they were skilled. They had, uh, that's what we mean by manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts. That's where it comes from. Okay. Uh, Romans written by Tertius, 1 Corinthians by Sosthenes, 2 Corinthians by Timothy, Philippians and Colossians by Timothy, 2 Thessalonians by Silvanus, Philemon by Timothy, 1 Peter by Silvanus. Read 2 Peter and compare it to 1 Peter in Greek. You can't believe the difference. Peter's Greek, the second letter, is crude by comparison. 1 Peter is polished because it's done by a professional. These were secretaries, stenographers, in effect. Not everybody was like Matthew who took shorthand. And I'm not saying they necessarily took shorthand, but they were professional public stenographers. They may have, they, they may have uh, indulged in that for themselves. I, have, I, don't, I don't know the technology there. Well, we've gone through Romans. Remaining 
there are, uh, of these 13 are 12 others, and we will take 10 of them uh, subsequently, all in one session. We won't go into this much detail. We'll just highlight the main pe- elements of some of these. We will leave First and Second Thessalonians uh, for later, because we're, when we we'll get to, uh, I think it's hour 21, we'll have a review of eschatology, and we'll focus on those eschatological epistles as part of that review because we'll have our hands full next time skimming through these uh, uh, the other uh, Pauline epistles. The session after that we'll take, the he- we'll take the book of Hebrews as the exemplar and then we'll talk about the Hebrew epistles and then of course we'll have, we're setting ourselves up for a review of eschatology and then we'll also deal, we'll budget three sessions for the book of Revelation. Or actually, yeah, okay. So we have Romans, definitive doctrines you've gone through. Corinthians will be the order in the church, the Galatians, law versus grace. Ephesians deals with the heavenlies. There's some surprising, uh, it's breathtaking things in Ephesians. Um, Philippians, joy through suffering. Colossians, Christ is preeminent above all things. The Thessalonians are the eschatological. Eschatology is simply being a fancy word for the study of the end times and, and, and last things. So the second coming primarily is the focus of second, first and second Thessalonians. The two letters to Timothy are Paul's advice as a pastor. Titus, same thing. And Philemon is intercession. You, you get the whole grasp of what intercession is by this little tiny little epistle called Philemon. We'll obviously summarize that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.